All right, guys. If you got a Bible, open it up. If you got a Bible, open it up to 2 Samuel chapter 3. I don't know. Is, does anybody else have Verizon in this place? Is your Verizon all squirrely today? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I was like... Thank you. I feel good about that now. I was just I was like, man, it's just not I was like, is it my phone? I was like, it's weird. So crazy, crazy. Second Samuel chapter three. And let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. We ask that tonight, Lord, that you would just speak to our heart, that we may just grow in you. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship, the worship, the prayer, Lord, tonight. And Father, if there's anybody here that just needs a, a word from you, Lord, let your word be sufficient. And just speak to the heart. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So in 2 Samuel chapter 1, we see that Saul has died and David mourns his death. David finds out, of course, from an Amalekite. And you know that Amalekites and David just don't mix. And, uh, and he takes out the Amalekite. Now we think that the, the Amalekite was claiming that he killed Saul. But in reality, he didn't. He was just trying to get the prize. But David takes the guy out anyways for his line. Uh, and, uh, and really just the pillaging of the body of Saul is what he did. And in chapter 2, we see David become the king of the tribe of Judah. And so he is the king of the tribe of Judah where he is just, uh, uh, just one tribe, just his tribe, his family tribe. The rest, of course, during that time, he, he's making uh, gestures of peace towards Jabesh Gilead, who was a, a town that was... Uh, kind to Saul that was sympathetic with Saul and the and the Benjaminites and in chapter 2 we see him doing that but then Abner steps in the general of Saul and his army and Abner steps in and it says no 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 we're going to do it my way we're going to do it the way I want to do it and he becomes like a uh, the puppeteer of this guy who is the fourth son of Saul the younger guy named Ishbosheth and Ishbosheth comes in and says hey I'm the king now, and Abner gives him the strength. He's really a weak sauce king, but he is the king of the northern tribes of Israel, the ten tribes. And Ishbosheth, I can't say his name. Ishbosheth is just a puppet of Abner, and so it's just like a just a strange, what we called it last week, a rival throne. And when you have a rival throne, you just can't take over in the right way that God wants you to take over. Same thing with our lives and our hearts. When there's a rival throne, when there's some other thing that is calling out to us to worship it and to serve it, we just can't adequately serve the Lord. And so here he is, Ishbosheth, controlled by Abner, the general. Also, Abner was Saul's uncle. And he makes this puppet king, Ishbosheth, there. And then we see how Abner and Joab in chapter 2 start this war, this civil war. And it was really a disturbing story that we see by the pools of Gibeon where they sit down there and they're, they're, uh, they send out 12 guys from each side and they, and they said, let's, let's have it out. It was Abner's idea. Let's have it out with these uh, 12 of my guys, 12 of your guys, and we'll just throw it down and see who wins. And it says that they were so well trained pretty much in the same school of warfare, that they both did the same maneuvering and ended up having not just a few dead, you had 24 dead young men around the pool of Gibeon. It was just a wasted time, wasted amount, but then that broke out into a big, long day war. And Abner is on the run. Abner is losing. And there is a group of three guys, the sons of David's sister, the, the nephews of David. And they are Joab, Abishai, and Aziel. And these guys come out, these three sons of Abishai and Asiel. But the thing is, Asiel comes out. And <laughs> the funny thing is, Asiel comes out and he just chases after Abner. After him like a little puppy dog nipping at the heels of Abner. And Abner says, man, why don't you leave me alone, man? Turn aside. Go, go, go pillage something. Go, go somewhere else. Well, what happens, man, he warns him. And it says that Abner takes the blunt end of his spear and thrusts it through the body 
of Asiel, and he dies. And when that happens, they're in shock. Well, the battle progresses. Abner loses, but it becomes a protracted war. And that's where we pick up the story. Now, Joab takes the body of his younger brother back, and they bury it in the family tomb. We see that happen. And so Joab has it out for Abner. So it's a family conflict. Look at verse 1. It says, now, of chapter 3, Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Now, this is a long war. In the Hebrew here, it literally, if you're taking notes tonight, the long war that's mentioned here is a protracted hostilities amongst the two houses. That means it wasn't just a, a long war. It was a protracted hostility. It could have been dealt with very quickly, but it was just egged on, protracted hostilities. And notice it wasn't the King David's war. Notice the verbiage here. It wasn't that David made war against the house of Saul. It was the house of David against the house of Saul. That means it was family against family. Some people actually believe it was the tribe of Judah against the tribe of Benjamin. And it was the, their two houses. It was the king's family, uh, the old king's family, and then David's family. And it really what it comes down to, it was Abner, who was family of Saul, versus Joab, which was the, the nephews of David. So it was, it was that type of thing going on. It was a a real mafioso war going on, family versus family that was going on here in Israel. And it wasn't so much from David, but from the family. But it was, a, a, but notice this, a spiritual truth is seen here. Notice it says that the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker, and the house of David grew stronger and stronger. Saul is a type of the flesh. He's a type of the world, the type of just sin selfishness and pride and ambition that's what Saul was all about but here in this passage we see something crazy the spiritual truth that those things of the flesh will always grow weaker and weaker but the things of the spirit that David was anointed right guys well guess what those grow stronger and stronger so the thing is what house are we going to be a part of I want to be on the side where the spirit's working I don't know about you I just want to be where the spirit's moving you know, I can get so caught up in the flesh and the, and the work of my hands or the work of other people's hands, but I want to be where exactly where the spirit is leading. That's your strong point. That's the house that's strongest is where the Holy Spirit's at. That's where all the power comes. That's where all the truth comes. And so one will grow weaker and weaker. I'll tell you guys, in your life, if you feel like you're weak spiritually, Get the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to come upon you and you'll never be the same. Ask the Holy Spirit to just empower you. There's a lot of things that cause us to become weak and they're usually having to do with the, the fact that I'm in the flesh. I'm acting more solely than I am David. I'm going, I'm going uh, in the power of my own might and not in the power of the spirits. And one will take you weaker, one will take you stronger. Make sure that it's in the right direction. Make sure you're on the strong side, which is the spirit side. And in verse 2, it says, now, he gives a little details about the, I call them the, the kids from Hebron. David is going to take on more wives, and he's going to have more kids. And this is a listing from verse 2 through 5 about who's who in the family. Kind of like David's family tree. Sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon. By Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess. Now we know who she is. She was picked up during the time Abigail was picked up. Now remember, he has a wife already. That is a, the wife named Michal, or some people call her Michelle. And she was the daughter of Saul. But remember what happened with her? During the time where Saul kicks out David, he takes his wife and gives her to another man. And so he does not see his wife at all for a very long time and she's hooked up with another guy and they have kids and so david doesn't see her at all so he remarries abigail which is the the wife of uh another a man's wife who dies and she's a widow and he marries her uh just a uh just a wonderful woman abigail was and she he also has this other woman named ahinoam who is a jezreelitess and Je ahinoam 
gives him that firstborn son named Amnon. And, and, his, uh, and his second, Chiliab, by Abigail, the widow of Nabal. So his second son is Chiliab, uh, uh, Nabal the Carmelite. And the third is a kid named Absalom, the son of Maha, the daughter of Tamali. <laughs> uh, Tam Talme I'm just craving him. Talmay, okay, it's not Tamali, Tam Talmay. And that is the king of Geshur. Now, this is the neat thing, guys, that's so cool, is that this was a, a marriage that was made by a pagan or someone outside. This, the area of Geshur is on the other side of the Jordan. It's what we know of Jordan today. It was a small tribal area. And back in the day, in order to make peace, you would marry someone of that country. And so that's what he does with Geshur. And he marries this woman, uh, Tamali. No, so just joking. Tamal, uh, Talmay. And they have a child named Absalom. They also have a, a daughter that we're going to see later on. And the fourth is Adonijah, the son of Hagith. And the fifth, Sephati, the son of Abital. And the sixth, uh, Atharim, by David's wife, Eglah. And we don't know a lot about those last two. And these were born in the, in, to David in Hebron. So... These people, these names, you will see them again. It is some important stuff that will happen with these kids. And it's going to be crazy. The Hebron kids were problems for David. Uh, they, 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 um, they gave David grief. Now you're like, oh man, it's, you know, they, they, you, you may think you have bad kids, but this is pretty bad. Okay, so uh, we see that. What, what, what happens? We see that Amnon, his firstborn, becomes a rapist of his half-sister, Absalom's sister. He rapes his half-sister. It's a horrible story. Then Absalom, which is the third child, goes and kills Amnon, the oldest child. And then he, later on, is forgiven. But then all, then all of a sudden, he comes in and tries to kick out his father as king and does it. Becomes a usurper. And then the second child, Chiliab, Abigail's son, we think dies at a very young age. And then after all that's taken care of, Absalom, of course, is killed by a, a person. I won't tell you who it is. I won't, don't want to bring any spoilers into the story. But Adonijah comes up, and he tries to take over when David's older and tries to take away the throne from the rightful heir, which is Solomon. And so you got these Hebron kids that just got some problems. And notice he has added to himself, he has six wives that is mentioned here. Actually, he has seven, not including Machal, which is somewhere else. Now, in Deuteronomy 17, 17, we know very clearly that there are rules given for the king. And in chapter 17, those rules were given. They, God anticipated the day that they would have a king. And in that kingship, he says, hey, do not add for yourselves multiple wives. Don't have a polygamous relationship. Now, Originally speaking, Genesis chapter 2, God designed marriage to be between a man and a woman, period. And that's it. No extras. No extra husbands on the side. No extra wives on the side. You can't hide them in the cupboard. It, it is just those two. Man and wife, period. And so something happens where they just forget about this. And they said, hey, let's have multiple wives. And you see it very quick in the book of Genesis. You see it where some guy gets two wives. He becomes a polygamist. And you really see it in the kings. You see it come up. And you see it through also in, the, in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And it's just like you see it. And I, I know that was before the law, but you see it even happen after the law with people. And when this occurs and he says, H -h -h, kings don't do this. It was, a very, it was a pagan practice for kings in that culture to add wives. And they did it for peace agreements, for treaties, for financial gain. They did it for his status. David set the trend. David added these wives and, and he had concubines as well, just for pleasure. Now, first of all, you're like going, oh. David? He's such a great guy in the Bible. 
the Bible in the Old Testament does not hide the fact that David is human and a failure just as much as we are. You're like, and you know what? I kind of like that because I'll tell you, if David messes up and gets grace, we can too get grace. Now, does he have to pay the price for it? Yeah, it's going to be some painful experiences for him, just like us when we fall into sin. God will correct us, and it's sometimes not pleasant. Spankings from God are not a fun thing to go through. But yet the grace is sufficient. He'll take us through it all. So he has a polygamy problem. And it's there. And you're going to find out that every person in the Bible that had multiple wives and a polygamy problem, there's always problems. There's issues that arise. There's no peace in the house. You know, I knew, I knew a guy one time that says, oh, wouldn't it be great to have multiple wives? I'm like, go be a Mormon, man. Leave me alone. Like, what is your problem? That's awkward. No way. Look at the scriptures. I'll tell you, I love my wife, but I could barely handle her. You know, and she could barely handle me. You know, it was like good grief. It's like one is enough for each of us. You know, it's like, Ugh. But good grief, man. This guy, is, and, and of course, his son Solomon is going to just take it to the, to the, to the, to the, to the extreme. I mean, he's got 700 wives, 300 concubines. Uh, it is nuts. And, uh, uh, but he has, he has them. And, uh, and, and what happens to Solomon? It says that his wives turned his heart away from the living God. This is the wisest man on earth who was blessed by divine wisdom. And guess what? His heart was turned away. And so that's Solomon. And, uh, but here he is. And Abner is, uh, well, so that, that's his family. And he just wants to get this out here to, to show that he's getting stronger and stronger. And Abner in the house of Saul is getting weaker and weaker. In verse 6, now, it was so while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David that Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispa and the daughter of Aia. Uh, so Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Now, here's another cultural point that we need to point out. When a king, a new king, took over, sometimes that king would take the concubines of the previous king and have relations with them sexually in order to show himself to be now I'm in charge and I'm the one. Absalom will do the same thing with the concubines of David when he takes over, over his father's house. And Ishbosheth is the king. He's the one in charge. But Abner comes in as this puppet master, as the power behind the throne, and he takes his brother's concubine and has relations with her. Her name was Ritzba. And so when that happens, we see something very clear. It wasn't just this romantic affair that was going on. No, Abner was saying, I am in control. I want to be king. This was really the first step of Abner taking over the throne from Ishbosheth in the north. And so when you had a, con a taking of a concubine, of a previous king, it's a step in doing that hostile takeover of the throne. And so when this happens, Ishbo comes in and he goes, dude, what are you doing? He says, I, I, why are you doing this? And he, because Ishbosheth knows you're trying to usurp my authority as king. And when this happens, Abner doesn't take the questioning lightly. In verse eight, he goes off on him. And then Abner became very angry at the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head that, you, that belongs to Judah? Today I show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father, and his brothers, and to his friends, and have not delivered you into the hand of David. And you charge me today with a fault concerning this woman? May God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not do for David as the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul, and set up his throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. Boy, talk about that escalating quickly. He just goes, hey, why were you, why did you have relations with my father's concubine? And then Abner, it's kind of, that vein pops out of his head. And he goes, what? Am I the head of a dog that belongs to Judah? Like, what in the world does that mean, first of all? He's pretty much saying, 
do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Am I a worthless dog of Judah? Which really shows that he has contempt for Judah. He says, do you know who that I am? The arrogance of Abner. I'm better than Judah. And you know who I am? I've been loyal to you. I've protected you, Abner says. And you treat me like this? He goes, that's it. I'm, he just said, verse 9, he says, I'm going to do for David as the Lord has sworn to him because I know David's anointed. He's going to be king and I'm going to him. And I'm going to transfer the kingdom of the house of Saul. These 10 northern tribes are now going to belong to David. Good grief. What took you so long? What took you so long, Abner, to come to this realization? Abner was with Saul from day one. He was with him through the whole time in Elah. He was with him at the banquets when Saul was chucking his spear at David. He was with him the whole time. And all of a sudden, Abner comes around and says, Hey, you know what? You are the anointed. And I'm going to switch. Was it because he was called out? Abner recognizes that David is king by the Lord. He recognizes the anointing. What took Abner so long? The fighting, the chasing, the killing of David. Now all of a sudden, he's the rightful king. Frankly put, guys, it's pride. He thought he could take that throne. He thought that he could establish my brother Saul and we'll all be fine and swanky. We're good. And then when Saul dies, I'm going to be the next guy. It was pride. Pride took so long. That's why the war was protracted. That's why it kept on going. That's why it took so long. It's the same reason why it takes so long for that lost loved one of yours to come to know the Lord. It's pride. They don't want to give up. Anytime that there's a rival throne in your life, in our lives, it just th takes things extra long to get done. And that's the reason why people take so long to come to the Lord. Sometimes I remember one guy got saved, a friend of a friend at church, and they looked at the guy, it was like at a harvest crusade, and the guy looked at him and says, what took you so long? Well, it was pride. I don't want to give up control. I don't want to surrender to Jesus. That's what salvation is all about. It's just surrendering to him, confessing our sins, giving up and making him the king and Lord, master, God of our lives. And he didn't want to give it up. The arrogance. You know, I always want to recognize that the Holy Spirit is anointed Jesus, that Jesus is king. That the, the, you know, when Jesus was baptized, that dove didn't land on anybody else except Jesus. It was the Lord Jesus. He's the one. He's anointed. He's Messiah. He's the Christ, the son of the living God. I will tell you, man, I want to yield to him quickly. Let's not be abnerish and just say, oh, well, you know, I, I think I could do it. I could do it. No, we got nothing. And so in verse 11, <laughs> poor, poor Ishbosheth, and he could not answer Abner. Another word, because Ishbosheth feared Abner. He couldn't talk. Have you ever been so scared that you couldn't talk? Have you ever been so scared that you're like, uh, 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 and you just, uh, uh, have you ever done that before? I'll tell you here, that's what Ishbosheth was. He couldn't even speak. The fear of men causes you to have silence. Good grief. And then in verse 12, then Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David saying, who is whose is the land? Who does the land belong to? Saying also to David by three messengers, make your covenant with me and indeed my hand shall be with you, David, and bring all of Israel to you. Wow. Notice Abner is saying, whose land does this all belong to? And then he proceeds to talk about my hand will deliver all of this to you. So what is he saying? I control this land. It's my land. I'll give it to you. I'll make you who you are, David. I will, I will make you. I will make you. Good grief. Isn't Abner is a dog. Talk about a head of a dog of a Judite. That's what he was. He was. He says, I'll bring it to you. No. 
No, 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 no. It wasn't Abner's hands. It's the Lord's hands. He does it. Good lesson that I've learned in my life. Never trust anything that isn't in the Lord's hands. Never trust anything that isn't in the Lord's hands. If it's in the Lord's hands, you can trust it. It's going to be okay. It's solid. It's kosher. But if it isn't, steer clear, my friends. And so there he is. Never trust anything that isn't in the Lord's hands. And so Abner says, I could deliver it to you. And David just agrees. He goes, all right, good. I'll make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. He says, I won't talk to you until I get my first wife back. Like, well, how many do you need, buddy? Well, he wants the first one back. I understand that. It, it was his right. Look at verse 14. So David sent messengers. He kind of bypasses Abner and he goes straight to Ishbosheth. And David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michal, whom I betrothed to myself for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. I remember that story. That's a great one of the best stories in the butt. Scary. You know, he, he goes up and Saul's trying to kill David. And Saul gets this crazy idea that only a lunatic can. He says, you know, if you really want my daughter, David, you're going to have to go out and kill 200 Philistines. And take, he, said, he says, I want their foreskins. Bring them in a bag. And that's disgusting. You know, David, you know Saul, come on, calm down, bro. So David goes out and gets 400. Brings them back. Throws them down. He says, where is she at? Give me my wife. Good grief. Ladies, don't you want a husband that will do that for you? No, I'm just joking. But <laughs> that's disgusting. Like some of you wives are like, oh, I just want him to go get me some milk at the grocery store, you know? <laughs> and so here he is, and he's just like, so he goes out and he gets him, brings him back, gets the uh the hall, the daughter of Saul. And, and so he wants her back. He wants her back. And so it says, and David sent messengers. Oh, so in verse 15, and Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband. What? Yeah, remember, she's married to another man. And she took her from her. And so Ishbosheth took her from her husband, from Paltiel, the son of Laish. Then her husband went along with her to Barim, weeping because uh, behind her. So you see, here's. Michal being led away. And the husband is be walking behind her, weeping. You're like, oh, that's so sweet. So Abner said to him, hey, go. Get back. Return. And then he walked away. You're like, that is so depressing. Poor, poor Patil. That is so cruel. David should have done that. Hey, they didn't care. David was like, oh, and she's mine. I had to, you know, you know what I had to do to get her? Do you know how I went through? See, all this, David has conditioned to give his first wife back because first of all, he wanted to say, I have a right to her. This is not right to have her go away. Pay, and also second, this is my payment for serving Saul. And he's saying, I serve Saul rightly and I want that payment back. And then he said, thirdly, he says, it shows that he's returning to how things were before the exile. Before I got chased out, this is how things were with my first wife. And I want her back. Now, you may say, now, a lot of people, <laughs> for those of the women's uh, 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 empowerment movement, it, 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 it looks like, good Lord, this is horrible. It's not fun. It's true. It's not it does, you, you're like, well, what rights did the women's have? Not that many. This is the culture back in the day. Now, there are some that will say, see, this is what's wrong with your Bible. Your Bible is oppressive towards women. Well, let me just, uh, for those people who would say this and say this is how Christians are, we don't do this as Christians. We don't say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm rule that. No, it's a totally different thing. It, even in the Bible, this is more of a cultural thing than it is a biblical thing. And so you see here that there is a, 
a thing where you got to separate what the Bible, what does the Bible say about marriage and equality and women's rights? That's the thing that's so important because they like to cherry, we, some people like to cherry pick verses and say, this is why God is evil. This is why Christianity is a bunch of hooey. Oh, let's read the whole book. Let's read everything about how women are treated. And you'll be pleasantly surprised that when you look at the Bible and what the scripture says, Old and New Testament, there is an equality that Judeo-Christian biblical values show and share about women that no other religion has. And it's a glorious thing. Remember, woman was taken out of the side of man, not the foot so that man could be over woman or, or out of the head so that woman be, would be above her husband, but to the side of equality. And then there's, a, then there's a leadership that the husband does. That's a glorious leadership. And so, guys, let me tell you, this is not oppression in a sense of from Christianity. This is just a cultural thing that happened back in the day. And it was different. Now, look at verse 17. So he goes away weeping, poor guy. Now, Abner had communicated with the elders of Israel, saying, In times past, you were seeking for David to be king over you. Now then, do it. So he's talking to the elders of Israel the 10 tribes of the north. Do it, make him king. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people, Israel, from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of the enemies. And Abner also spoke in the hearing of Benjamin. Then Abner also went to speak in the hearing of David and Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel and the whole house of Benjamin. So he just let it be known. We're going to join up with David. Let it be known. And he speaks to them in verse 20. And Abner spoke in the hearing of, oh, uh, sorry, verse 20. So Abner and 20 men with him came to David to Hebron, the big meeting. And David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. So they had a feast. David, notice the graciousness of David. Come in. I know our houses are at war. It's a family feud. But you know what? Let's eat. Let's talk these things over. And he extends a hand of kindness towards Abner. And then Abner said to David, I will arise and go and gather all of Israel to my Lord, the king, that they may make a covenant with you and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away and Abner went in peace. So there he is. David makes an agreement. We're not at war anymore. The war is ended. We're making peace. And he leaves Hebron, which is a city of refuge, in peace. He walks away. Now you might say, oh, I'm glad that's over. Well, not really. Remember, Samuel is like a big soap opera, especially 2 Samuel. It's like you get almost like, you know, you play those little violin, you know, as sons through the hour class, so is the days of David, you know? It, it, it's, it's rough. And so it gets rougher here. Abner walks away in peace. Everything's happy. They had a great feast. Everything went well. And then all of a sudden, guess who wasn't at the feast? Joab. And so it says in verse 23, when Joab and all the troops that were with him had come, they told Joab saying, Abner, the son of Ner came to the king and he sent him away and he has gone in peace. It's all over. They made an agreement. It's done. And then Joab came to the king and said, so Joab hears about this. And Joab came to the king and said, what have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away and, and he has already gone? Surely you realize, David, that Abner, the son of Ner, came to trick you, to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you are doing. Joab is mad. Joab is flabbergasted. He says, what have you done? Remember, Joab hates Abner for the killing of his younger brother. And Joab finds out, he says, what have you done? And he, he says, surely, David, you know that Abner has come to trick you. Uh, Joab is probably manipul trying to manipulate David at this point. Oh, he, he, surely you know, David, that he's come to trick you. That he just wants to find how you come out and go. This isn't over. Don't trust Abner. So 
What happens? Joab is just mad. And in verse 26, and when Joab had gone from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner, who brought him back from the well of Surah. But David didn't know it. Uh-oh. So the, the well of Surah, we believe, is around 5 to 10 miles north of Hebron. And he gets him back quick. He says, oh, David wants to talk to you again. He brings him back. We don't even know if he said David. He says, come back to Hebron. And David didn't know it. Joab had a plan. Verse 27. Now, when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately. And there stabbed Abner in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Aziel, his brother. Wow. Joab tricks Abner to come back. Before he could come into that city of refuge, that safe spot, he kills him in the gate. And he kills him in the same manner as his brother. Why did Joab kill Abner? Number one, revenge. He wanted to have revenge of his brother. Number two, it looked like Abner was going to be in a high position of influence with David. And Joab said, "Uh uh-uh, I am David's man, not you. And he took out his greatest rival right there. And number three, I don't think he trusted Abner one bit. And you know what? Joab might have been right on that point. Joab says, don't trust Abner. Don't trust Abner. Joab might have been right on that. Joab was very loyal to David, even though he liked to do things his way. If you really want to get down to it, Joab and Abner were very much alike. They were very much alike. And you'll see that through the life of Joab all the way through. You'll see it. And so Joab kills Abner. He acted foolishly, Abner did. He should have stayed. Now we know that Asiel was killed in battle, so it was a legitimate good kill. But if there's any time that you have a disagreement over a death of someone, the Bible says in the Torah that you go to a city of refuge, and Hebron was a city of refuge, and you wait there until a court proceeding can take place and find out how you should proceed and if there was really guilt or a fault and that's what it should have been done in the city of refuge but he was killed in battle that means it wasn't a he wasn't guilty of murder abner was but he there was a disagreement and he was hunting for him he should have stayed in that city of refuge but yet he left and as he tried to get in he didn't make it he was caught he acted foolishly abner had was a cocky little cuss and he left the city of refuge. You know, you know, spiritually speaking, in the Old Testament, the city of refuge is a type of Jesus Christ. Don't leave the refuge, which is Jesus Christ. And in verse 28, we see David's response. Afterward, when David heard it, he said, My kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever on the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. He goes, I am innocent. I had nothing to do with that because everybody's going to say, Oh, this is a hit. David's at fault. David did this. David's the one. And David is very bold and and brash. And he says, I and my kingdom are innocent. This is all Joab. And then he says, let it rest on the head of Joab and on on his father's house. And let there never fail to be in the house of Joab one who has discharge or is a leper or leans on a staff or who falls by the sword, or who lacks bread. Now that's a five-fold curse he slapped upon Joab's families right there. Some heavy stuff. Let there be a discharge. That means let you constantly have just bowel and stomach issues your whole life. Now that, that's a low blow, man, you know? May you always feel like you just ate a pound of dairy. You know, it just, it, it's just, be, just the ugh, grossness of it. And the reason why is people with a discharge like that, you're not allowed in the temple. You're not allowed in the tabernacle. You are unclean. He says, also let there never fail. Let there never be a stopping of someone who is a leper in his family. Let's always be someone struck with leprosy, a cousin, an an aunt, an uncle. Let there be someone has leprosy in the family. Or who leans on a staff. Someone who calls in crippleness. Or, Or falls by the sword, dies in battle. Or who lacks bread or poor. David was mad that Joab did this. 
And Joab, remember, is his nephew. And he's mad at this. And he says in verse 30, he says, So Joab and Abishai, the brothers, killed Abner because he had killed their brother, Asiel, at Gibeon in the battle. He says, both of them did it. It wasn't just Joab. It was Abishai as well. And in verse 31, And then David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes, gird yourself with sackcloth, and mourn for, Ab uh, for Abner. And King David followed the coffin. It was a public state funeral. And they mourned. Very interesting, though, guys. This word, and King David followed the coffin, is the first time David is seen and mentioned as King David. Right here. This is first mention. And he mourned for Abner. Notice he was called King David the moment that Abner was taken out. The power behind the throne, it's his. There's no other rival throne. Now he's the king. And in verse 32, and so they buried Abner in Hebron. And, they, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. So he's, they're crying. And the king sang a lament. Oh, no, he wrote a song. He sang a lament over Abner and says, should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put in fetters. As a man falls before the wicked men, so you fell. He says, you died a fool, Abner. You should never have come. You were tricked. You played the fool, just like his, uncle, just like his nephew did, Saul. He played the fool. You know, I, here's David just weeping over Abner. Abner wasn't, Abner didn't like David. We know that. He wanted the throne. He wanted the control of it all. And he thought my best bet to do this is to join David. If he was going to be a usurper just as bad as Absalom turned out to be. He was going to be that guy who always wanted the throne. John knew it. And Abner was not a good guy. And David is weeping over him. Why? It's a really neat picture of how the Lord is with the lost. The Bible says that the Lord doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, when we see the death of the wicked, what do we do? Like, yeah, yeah, this is awesome. You know, when we watch a movie and the villain dies, what do you do? Do you go, oh, poor bad guy. He should have had a second chance. No, we're like, man, burn the guy. Make him hurt. And I'll never forget when I was a kid in the 80s and going to see Rocky Part 3. With the Russian dude? I was at Lakewood Theater, dude, and with my dad. And I'll tell you, I, I never heard a crowd so into this movie. And when that Russian guy got knocked out by Rocky Balboa, if you would have thrown a Russian into that crowd, we would have killed him. <laughs> it was brutal. It was rough. And so we naturally want the defeat of the villain. But that's not how the Lord is. He doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. And that's just the loving heart of God. Now, does he stop it? There are some people that say that God will not punish the wicked. No, they're going to be punished already. They're on the way to hell. But God sent his son, Jesus, to stop that from happening. Isn't that nuts? That's just crazy. But it's true. It's so beautiful. All of mankind is destined to hell. You know, God doesn't have to send us there. We're already going there. But he sent his son, Jesus Christ, that he might be the substitute for our sins. And he came. And if we reject Jesus, then we're just saying we're stoked with the path that we're on, that path to hell. And he, he, he wants to rescue us out of it. He wants to change us. And even when the person, oh, that horrible concept of a person going to hell who's lost. Jesus isn't up there going, you deserve this. God isn't up there taking joy in it. It, it breaks his heart because Jesus came to seek and to save who? The lost. And it breaks his heart. And so here he is. And David is just being that. And then all the people wept again. And when all the people came to persuade David to eat food. So David's fasting. 
He's mourning. He's doing the fasting mournful. Uh, it was still day. And David took an oath saying, God do so to me and more also if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. He's doing his, his ritual fasting for the dead. Now all the people took note. Now he's doing all this stuff. He's mourning. He's really broken up about this. And the people notice it. Now all the people took note of it and it, and it pleased them. It was good to them. Since whatever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people and all of Israel understood that day that it, was not, it had not been the king's intent to, to kill Abner, the son of Ner. So the people realized, man, David loves this guy. He didn't kill him. Look at him. He won't even eat until sunset. He's mourning sackcloth, ashes, state funeral. He even wrote a song. Man. Then the king said to his servants, do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? David just had this compassion, this Christ-like compassion. And it's, it's this Jesusness. His son, his grandson, Jesus Christ, is going to have the same kind of compassion. So this, it was a great man had fallen this day in Israel. And you know, hey, he, you're like, but he wasn't David. He wasn't. David had a care for this guy. He says, and, and then I am, and then he, then he gets real pointed and sharp with Joab. He says, and I am weak today. I don't have enough strength yet as king. Though anointed king, and these men, the sons of Zariah, are too harsh for me. The Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. He says, I'm, you know what? I can't deal with them right now. I can't get to them right now. But the Lord will deal with them. The Lord will repay. And that's so true. David is letting God handle his problems. Now, quickly in chapter 4, it says, When Saul's son heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost heart. And all Israel was troubled. So they freaked out. They're like, oh my goodness, Abner's dead. Now, Saul's son had two men who were captains of the truth. So Ishbosheth had these two captains. The name of one was Baana, and the name of the other was Rahab, and the sons of Ramon, the Berothites, of the children of Benjamin. So they were, they were of the same tribe, for Beroth was also part of Benjamin. Because the Berothites fled to Gataim and had been sojourners there unto this day. So they're, they're, they're Benjaminites, these two captains of his. Jonathan, now, while this is going on, it says, Jonathan, Saul's son. Remember, Jonathan is the one that David just loved. It was his best friend. Jonathan had a son who was crippled in his feet. And he was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Now, just tuck that aside. You're going to get to know Mephibosheth later on. And he was crippled, he couldn't walk, but he was the son of Jonathan, okay? Just tuck that aside for a later chapter. Then the sons of Ramon, the Berothites, Rahab and Banan, set out and came at about the heat of the day to the house of Ish Ishbosheth, who was lying on his bed at noon. So he's just taking a little cat nap as king, a, ki a king's cat nap in the heat of the day. And these two captains came to his house. And they came there all the way into the house as though to get wheat. And they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rahab and Banan, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he was lying on his bed in his bedroom. And they struck him and killed him. And they also beheaded Ishbosheth, took his head, and were all night escaping through the plain. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David of Hebron. And said to the king, here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. And the Lord has avenged my Lord, this king this day, of Saul and his descendants. Man, why, why, what is up with people thinking that David wants everybody's head? Or want, <laughs> wants to kill everybody? You know, didn't they learn anything from the last dude that did this? And so but David answered Rahab and Banan, his brother, and, and the sons of Ramon, and the, the Berothite, and said to them, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all adversity? When someone told me, saying, Look, Saul is dead, thinking they had brought good news, I arrested him and had him executed at Ziglag, the one who thought I would give them a reward for his news. 
How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous person, we're talking about Ishbosheth, in his own house, in his bed. Therefore, shall I not now require his blood at your hands and require you to be removed from the earth? So David commanded his young men, and they executed those two, cutting off their hands and feet, and hung them in the pool of Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner in Hebron. Good grief. Notice this last verse, and this is what we're going to close tonight. David answered those two guys before he, he chopped them up and killed them. He says, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all adverse, adversity. He says, I don't need your help, guys. I didn't need you to redeem me from Ishbosheth. I didn't need your help to take care of this problem. I have a God who's my redeemer. And that's the thing that's so cool that David understood is that David understood this beautiful fact that Jesus is our redeemer. God was his redeemer. And he didn't need anything else to redeem him. God took care of him. Now that takes a lot of faith. That takes a lot of faith on our part to say, you know what? God, you're going to be the one to redeem me. You're going to be the one to rescue me. You're going to be the one who's going to take me through this problem, this situation in my life. And not count on anyone else except the Lord. You're like, well, I can't do that. You know what? You might want to. Jesus is redeemer. And as he is the redeemer of, of everything in our life, he redeems everything. He just doesn't redeem us from hell and sin and the flesh and all the evils that we have done in our life. He also redeems us from the daily struggles. He redeems us from everything. It's in the nature of God to be a redeemer. And so we have to really trust in him to take care of everything. Because you know what? We could trust in man. We could trust in these guys. And, but what, what, what they're, they're just going to chop people's heads off. It's going to be messy. It's going to be a problem. But if we trust Jesus, he's going to take care of everything. And he'll redeem our lives. He'll redeem your time. He'll redeem your heart. He'll redeem everything. He'll redeem it all. I want to put my trust in Jesus to take care of everything in my daily life. And he will. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. But guys, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You won't regret it. One bit. Amen? Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. We ask that you would strengthen us day by day. Bless this church. Bless our hearts. Bless everything. Father, And we just ask that you would just help us to make you the redeemer of our lives. Not just for our sins at the cross, Lord, but our, our daily redemption to take us through it all. We love you and praise you and thank you for bringing us together tonight in order to grow in you through your word. Lord, we thank you that you have spoken to us. And we are now more mature through your word and through the power of your spirit than anything else. In Jesus' name, amen. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. I love you guys. Jesus loves you. Have a great night. Two chapters, too. Woohoo!